Hello, DLD. It's uh, fantastic to be here. My name is Ryan Panchad Sorum, and I'm currently an EIR at Kleiner Perkins, which is a venture capital firm in Silicon Valley. But I was fortunate to spend the past three and a half years as the Deputy Chief Technology Officer for the United States. And in that role, my team was responsible for ensuring that the federal government uses technology in a more modern way. What I'm going to do here today is actually tell you a story perhaps of the most ultimate bureaucratic nightmare of all time, of modern history, the rollout of healthcare.gov. October 2013 should have been a normal, normal uh, fall in DC, but something was brewing. Just three and a half years earlier, the president had signed into uh, a law, the Affordable Care Act, and what that did was transform for the better our country's healthcare system. One piece of the change was a website a website that would let any American buy a health plan. And for the first time, this health plan couldn't reject them based on a pre-existing condition, and they could actually buy a plan that didn't discriminate based on gender or health condition. Part of that rollout was on October 1st, 2013, the website was supposed to launch. But as many of you know, when that site hit the street, it received hundreds of thousands of uh, views, and the load took down the system. Over the next 17 days, you had non-stop coverage on television about the site not working, people not being able to uh, purchase health care plans. And around day 17, I got a call, along with a few others from the White House, asking if we'd be on a team to help assess if the site could be fixed or if it had to be scrapped. The team was pretty small. It was just five of us. And we came from places like Microsoft and Google and the campaign. But the one thing we shared in common was that we knew how to build these services. And so when we got there, things are pretty rough. Uh, one of the first things we noticed is that we kept seeing this blue screen of death. We're all pretty familiar with that. This was healthcare.gov's version. We also noticed that there was no monitoring. So you actually didn't know if the site was up or if the site was down, and that's an issue. So one of the things we did was install a tool called New Relic to be able to test that. For the folks in the room that take care of large systems and you know, keep uptime uh, a look into it, Nines is the way that you measure it, and five nines is a really good service. That means you basically only go down a second a day, which only amounts to about five minutes a year. That's a really good service. Four nines gets you to less than 10 seconds. Three nines is, I think, about a minute and a half down each day. Two nines, which is actually in a bad place to be, is about 15 minutes. Healthcare.gov was barely hitting 50%. That meant it was down close to 12 hours a day, which in a lot of ways you could think meant it was not open for business. And so what also happened is on that first day, those hundreds of thousands of people trying to buy healthcare, only six were able to. The rest were quite hopeless. While we were there in the first 70 hours uncovering everything, trying everything we can, we started to lose hope ourselves as well too. Because everything we tried, we really couldn't rein in this system. But about 90-ish hours in, uh, pretty much of no sleep, we found a breakthrough. And the breakthrough was that the database was queuing unnecessarily, amount, uh, unnecessarily. And when you started to unplug that, response times that took two minutes, now we're taking 30 seconds. Not great, but it gave us the sign that we needed that this could be turned around. And so that's when we turned from an assessment team into a rescue team. And so we got to work. One of the first things we did was install a war room. And this is where you had the entire leadership leads of the team's staff 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And we needed this because this was a big project, right? You had 20 companies involved. You had hundreds of engineers and thousands of call center representatives. And you needed to find a way to bring them on the same page. The war room had three simple rules. The rule number one was that it was meant to be solving problems. It was not a place to be shifting blame, because at the time, there were a lot more other venues for people to be able to do that. Rule number two, it was that the person that was supposed to be speaking when troubleshooting issues were the folks that knew the most about the issue, not the managers, not rank and title. Because if you get the engineers to talk about the issue, you probably could get to a solution a lot faster. And then, of course, rule number three, the war room was for the most important problems, the things that were going to hurt us in the next 24 and 48 hours. The second thing we needed was new marching orders. Right? There were thousands of bugs, different lists, and when you talk to the call center reps and the developers, they would share different parts of the system that were broken. And so we needed to look through to see what really were symptoms and root core issues. And through some ruthless prioritization, we created one list, a marching order, of what needed to be done. But the most important thing that happened was air cover. 
air cover from the top of the White House to the leadership of Health and Human Services to be able to, for us to do the right thing. And the right thing in that moment was taking some processes that would take a week, like approvals, and turning them into things that would take minutes. And so that was incredibly essential. And so this march continued day after day after day, and these ended up putting up close to 15 to 20 hour work days. And I used to be wearing my little Fitbit, and um, the amount of sleep that we were getting was quite brutal. But what you started to see was a team that had only shipped a release once in October into someone that started shipping every single week, and every single release started letting more and more people into the system. I remember looking at the numbers maybe somewhere around week three of this uh, rescue and started kind of calculating them. And I actually started tearing up because I didn't believe what I was seeing. Just two weeks earlier, you had barely two people getting through the system, two out of 10, and I was seeing seven out of 10. This was the signs that we needed to see that every single little number that was registering on our metrics meant that a real person was getting health care. And that's incredibly powerful. One of the things that kept the entire team going, right, this was an effort that took everyone in government and the folks outside, was that there were these letters that were written to the president. And one of them was very powerful. It was of a mother writing into the president, sharing that this was the first time that she could finally afford health care for herself, because for the past couple of years, she's been spending all of that money on her child. And so this is what this was able to do. And what you started to see in October, there was 250,000 signups, and all the way into December, you had close to 2 million. While this was great and got us into the holidays, many of the teams started leaving, but we needed reinforcements because every single month, the traffic kept going higher and higher and higher. And as anyone knows with these systems, as traffic goes higher, you start to run into more issues. And so beautifully in January, February, March, and finally April, when open enrollment closed, we'd enrolled over 8 million people. And so I have a little shot here of the uh, midnight of open enrollment, and this is part of the team. And the number was something like 8 million, 2,000. And the 8 million number is important, but to me, the 2,000 number was incredibly special. Because what that meant is that every little bit of effort over that past five, six month period counted. The extra night staying late, the extra release, sending those emails out, asking more Americans to come in to buy plans. And so what that meant was this was an incredibly large team effort. The next day, the president was in the Rose Garden being able to celebrate this moment. If you asked anybody in November if we would able to reach 8 million, they would have said no. This is one of my favorite uh, news clips from, the, uh, from that day. Um, if you say it aloud, it, you'll get the joke. Um, so what happened, right? What went wrong in this disaster? Well, unfortunately, this was business as usual, right? This is business as usual for most governments, state, federal, local in the United States, but also abroad too, all the governments that we're a part of, and even some large tech companies as well. And so what I'm gonna do for the next few minutes is actually run through some of the bad habits that are happening and how you actually can start to fix them. One of the worst things ever are these incredibly large monolithic contracts that go to one vendor. In the United States, they can be as, as much as hundreds of millions of dollars. And they get one based on PDFs and PowerPoints, not actual true competition of what you actually can build. So is this like rocket science? Well, actually it might be, right? And this is what NASA does. For the resupply mission uh, that NASA put out, the $12 billion procurement, what they did is they said, hey, companies out there that can launch, we want you to submit a proposal. Five did, and they gave a small amount of money to actually see if they could send a rocket into space. Two were able to, and NASA awarded them the contract. It's a very conservative way to de-risk a project. The other, uh, uh, one of the other culprits was waterfall development. Going into a room for three and a half years and building something and then putting it out, expecting it to work, is one of the, the best paths to failure that you can find. In the modern day, most of the most modern companies will build things in more of an agile and iterative fashion. You work for a few months and you try it out with users and then you iterate and repeat based on what you learned. This is a more successful way to build things. Design by committee doesn't work. How are 12 people in a committee accountable to anything? They're not. And so what you need is strong product owners, people who have designed these services before leading them. One of the other issues as well, too, is if anyone here goes into a negotiation in a different language, you're, of course, going to bring your own translator. So why, when we go into technology projects, do we do things differently? So when you have an IT project, why don't you have smart engineers on your team helping push to make sure that the technology decisions are right? 
Or when you're doing something in tech policy, like net neutrality encryption, why do we ask the engineers last what the ramifications would be? The word enterprise is a, a stamp, but it doesn't mean things are going to work. Everything on healthcare.gov was enterprise grade. Today, what you need to be doing is choosing proven technology. And more often not, proven technology comes from consumer companies, right? The Airbnbs of the world, the Netflix. And what you're going to find, the tools that they use are quite different. And if more often than not, they're also open source. And, you know, nothing smells more like bureaucracy than silos of information. And so one, rep, uh, one uh, uh, antidote to that is uh, transparency, which breaks down walls, and of course, collaboration as well, too. The tool New Relic was incredibly powerful because everyone had access to it. It wasn't, there was no single arbiter of information. We used tools like HipChat and Slack to coordinate. If anyone here is still in an organization and is still sending around Word documents, you need to step into the future a little bit. So these ingredients are how you create a successful technology project. But also, they're the same ingredients for disruption that some of the largest tech companies are doing today, the Ubers of the world, the Instacarts. They're in markets where there's active competition forcing them to do better. They're not having four-year timelines. They're building things based on what people really need. They have highly accountable product managers that focus on users. They attract incredible talent and fight for it. And also, they work in ways that are incredibly open and collaborative. We're entering a new world, really a new reality, where every single program and policy that governments do, and even companies, are dependent on technology. This is a good friend and a visionary, Jake Brewer. He was taken from this world far too soon, but he had this saying, which was, technology isn't a piece of the pie. It's actually the whole. It's integral to everything. And so when we're looking for ways to make the right thing stick, you have to remember everything we did on healthcare.gov, nothing was illegal. We broke no rules. Those ingredients, doing them, that's not breaking a rule either. So the secret in making this work is actually people. What healthcare.gov did for the United States is that it showed people how broken government tech really is. But what it also showed was that if you get talented people in government, you actually can make change happen. And so if you look at this photo, this is 200 people that have joined the United States Digital Service and the United States federal government working in tech. These are folks from Google, from Facebook, from Microsoft, from Twitter. In the picture, you have the third engineer from Amazon. She is responsible for getting that smiley box to your door. She joined the Department of Veterans Affairs to help them with their claims backlog. You have one of the lead engineers and CTOs of Hulu working at the Department of Ed to make it easier for our students in America to find really good colleges. And you also have the director of operations at Twitter to uh, help build platform services that make it easier for these kinds of tools to be rolled across government. And everyone here chooses to serve a different length of tour of duty. Some people are in government for six months, or people like myself ended up spending three years. Our founding fathers said it incredibly well. They said, we the people. The solution here is really to inspire a new generation of public servants. And it's people like you and me that need to start serving in government. And this concept of people coming together isn't an American one. It's an incredibly European one as well, too. When you look in France, it's by the people and for the people. In Germany, authority is derived from the people. So what always will hold true is governments are going to only be as strong as the people that work in there. Yes, bureaucracies are hard. Government working in it is incredibly hard, too. But the change you're able to do inside of it can impact hundreds and thousands and even millions of people. The hard work is always going to be hard, but we all love the countries that we're from. And if we're not going to help, who will? Thank you very much. Thank you.